All right, so what's up, guys? Back in. We're here with part two, and uh, let's just get right into it. Definitely. What you got for us? All right, you know, uh, we talked about a good amount of things right now. Uh, I think the biggest question coming is uh, going to be the RTC Cup presented by Flow. You know, with over $200,000 in payouts. You know, I think my first thought on this was uh, it seemed good when it said $200,000 in payouts because on the post I was seeing all around Instagram, it only showed like four or five wrestlers, right? But then you look into it and there's at least about like a hundred guys competing. So what's your thought on this? I, I like it. I like the whole, like you said, the whole league thing um, with the RTC um, kind of clubs all together. It's a great, it's a great concept. Um, and it includes a lot of wrestlers. Uh, that $200,000 in payout don't come from anything. That, that's from, from fans. That's from viewers. Uh, that money's not just made up. The wrestlers aren't paying to compete. So that money's coming from somewhere. So that means the sport is growing. So I think it's great. And I think there's some, some pretty cool matchups that haven't looked too far into it yet, but, but yeah. 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 I think that having that revenue coming straight from fans. Yeah, you're right. There's a hundred competitors and $200,000 payout. Like if everybody got the same, it'd be $2,000 a person. But even then that's money that they weren't making before. Flow is making huge leaps and bounds for the wrestling community in actually paying these wrestlers, you know, before flow was paying them, like, and this was recent, this happened last year from, from what I know, and then beat the streets paid them a little bit, but not nearly as much as flow was paying them. This is, this is life changing for wrestlers because there is money in the game. Jordan Burroughs was talking about it before, before um, flow was doing these tournaments and doing payouts. He said, the only way I make money is sponsorships, right? Chobani, he, he, he made a whole bunch of money off sponsor, off his sponsorship with Chobani. And that's, and that's how he survived. Yeah. And, and relying on that for the entire revenue of a senior level Olympic sport is not sustainable. Yeah. So to recap, yeah, it's not ideal that there's only $200,000 for a hundred people, but it is a beginning. Yeah. I think obviously it's going to be a little bit different for like these average guys. They're like, you know, D1 all Americans, so like no slouches, but they're nothing really compared to these top level guys. You know, obviously Jordan Burrow is going to have a, a decent amount of sponsorships, which he could, which him is like, I think 700,000 Instagram followers could easily, he could easily make a living off that. You know, if he just wanted to start selling merch, stuff like that, like David Taylor or Cal Day could all make livings off of this. But then you move down to like the lower level guys who are going to be guys who need the money, you know, you see a lot of the guys who are trying to compete at the senior level. They're competing, but they're a little bit lower ranked there. Some of them are working jobs also in addition, trying to wrestle full-time at the senior level. And that's just really not going to work for them because at the end of the day, they're not going to be making a good amount of money from this cup. They're going to be one of the lower ranked guys. Definitely, which is why I think that competition shouldn't be the only stream of revenue for wrestlers, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, there's so much more that goes into the sport. There's coaches, there's athletic trainers, um, there's table workers, there's refs. Um, all, this, all these people are just very involved just as much as the athletes are in the sport. I mean, you probably remember who your youth coach was and you, he probably helped you a ton. Um, I think that's, again, it brings you back to my point, really pumping up youth in high school wrestling can, can build more clubs, build more jobs um, if you necessarily can't compete. Um, let's say Jordan Burroughs, and I hope this would never happen, broke his back tomorrow or the next day he competes. Um, his career is over. And so somebody who of, might be a little bit less caliber, like you're saying, the NCAA All-Americans, um, they might not be able to make money because all they know is wrestling. They wrestled. They put so much into the sport. What did they really get out of it? Yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. There's a lot of determining factors that go into a lot of things. You kind of just have to – a lot of guys kind of have to hope for the best in that situation. Correct. So that, that, that's another thing is, is injuries. Um, I'd say a lot of college level, on, especially D1, I don't know how it works with the D2, D3 um, kind of zone. when They don't really treat injuries as like – they don't try to make you better, if that makes sense. They just try to get you through. Yeah. Um, so do you, you think there's a better way to address that, Ben, input on this as well? Is there a better way to address injuries in the sport? Because a lot of people come into college wrestling with significant injuries, and, and including myself. I was one of those 
people. Yeah, you know, I think that that's a huge. I was actually talking about this with my uh, with my roommate. Um, looking back on my high school career, when I was when I was younger, I remember thinking, "Oh shit, that guy's got a shoulder brace. He's got to be raw. He's got to be really good. Like that's that's intimidating, right?" And and when you think about it, right, when you're when you're at that level, when you want to keep wrestling and you want to fight through whatever tweaks and bruises and and bumps and scrapes you've got you're you're at a higher level than the people at your school right you're 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 clearly superior to those people at your school you have no worry about your varsity spot you're worrying about the state tournament you're worrying about fargo at that point and i think that that's that's something that the sport as as a sport really 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 builds is is kind of that that desire to fight through because we fight through everything right we you know we we cut weight you know and then we got to worry about all, all of the things that come with wrestling. And I think that, that that is not, not something that changes at the levels. I think that's something that has to change individually first. I, I keep talking about Bryce Meredith and I hate doing it, but I, but he's just another great example. He talked about through his whole college career, he just pushed through, he just pushed through, he just pushed through. And then his senior year, he got really sick and he, he told his coach for the first time, he's like, coach, like I, this is not a functional practice. Like I am not getting anything from this practice. I'm not helping anybody in this practice. And he went to the sauna and he, and he, you know, he sweat, he felt better. He took some medicine. He came back the next day. He said he felt better and he was able to train. I think that wrestling as a community needs to start drawing a harder line in the sand, excuse me, between a boo-boo and an injury. And when you're, when, you're, when you're touching that injury line, you need to make yourself better. I did that for the first time my senior year. Uh, I, I, took a, I took a tournament off. I tweaked my shoulder in the tournament before, and I was like, this, this next tournament is not important. I can, I can go down. I can compete. I can win. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is getting better. So I took the tournament off. I got better and came back, and I won the city tournament. And, yeah, I think that – yeah, I think that that's just a huge mental step for every wrestler. So, I'm probably not gonna obviously be the right person to ask about this. I've played, I've wrestled since uh, I was a freshman. Uh, I haven't been in sports in general for too long. Played football since I was in eighth grade. Uh, I'm probably not gonna play football in college, but not once have I suffered like an actual injury. Yeah, but you're, you're definitely a witness of a lot yeah. of injuries as, in the sport. You know about them. You know, um, you know Jordan Burroughs with his ankle injury. We've yeah. seen his knee injured. Um, we've seen all sorts of – Yanni with his knee injured. I mean, he had yeah. to come back from a major injury, and he became a national champ the next year. Like, Especially what you, Lee wouldn't even wear a knee pad after he tore his yeah. ACL. Like, it's, like it's, a, it's a mindset. Yeah, now, I've seen all this stuff everywhere, but at the end of the day, like, I don't think I can truly speak on that. Because, like, obviously, like, you know – during football, I would have, like, bruises and cuts, like, all over me after practice. But, like, at the end of the day, that's really nothing, you know. Maybe I sprained my ankle or something and just get back to practice. But I've never been in that situation, like a torn ACL, broken bone. I might add – I think I broke my finger once, and that was really it. But then I just played through. I just put a glove on, so whatever. Like, I've never had one of those injuries to an extent where I can really speak from experience there. So it's just kind of interesting to hear what other people have to say in that scenario. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky world. That's all I can say is I got injured in college and I always felt like, hey, I could be there. I just, my body's not letting me be there, if that makes sense. So I tried to figure out what's wrong, what's wrong. Um, I fractured my SI joint, which is like right by um, your hip. Um, and I tried to figure out what was wrong with it for the entire time I was at UNC and it really hurt my career. Um, and I, I think it might have been different if that wouldn't have happened. And I would have liked to seen some more like proactive um, from coaches, from the training staff of, hey, we need to fix this before we keep wrestling, if that makes sense. Um, I know it's hard to speak on without actually being injured, um, but, you know, that's my, that's my point on that. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that sense. I, don't have to, I didn't have to deal with this yet, but I think I just always have to be prepared for that. But, you know, uh, as we're moving on with this, we, I have uh, some matchups written down for the RTC Cup, which is going down December 4th and December 5th. So, uh, first we can just go – I think you guys have probably looked at that a little bit. Yeah, okay. So, I think uh, my final pick on the team, I'm going to have Spartan Combat taking the dub there. But I'd like to see what you guys' opinions are on this. Yeah, definitely. So, like I said, I haven't looked too much into it yet. Um, 
as it comes up, you know, a little bit more, I, I'll learn kind of what RTCs are involved because there's so many RTCs. I think we have two, yeah. two or three here in Colorado Springs area, whereas like five or six years ago, we had zero. We didn't have any RTCs at all. Um, so I really don't know which RTCs are involved. I'm sure it's just the basic ones. Like, what is it? The Wolfpack RTC? Yeah, um, Wolfpack is, uh, I think, Gwizdowski, Mike Machiavello, or the two, and Tommy Gant is there. Spartan, I think, is the biggest one because they obviously have Vito, Ruja at 57, Yanni Diakmaas at 65, Kyle Dake at 74, uh, Gabe and Max Dean at 86, and then uh, Scotty Boykin, I think it is, maybe an ISM or somebody else. Yeah, Scotty Boy. Yeah, he's, they have they have uh, Don Bradley, a heavyweight. Yeah, I, I've known Scotty for a long time actually. Uh, he's a cool guy, um, big dude. But um, yeah, no, I, I I would give that to you. I'd give it to Spartan because you, you know you have Yanni, you have everybody on that team is an absolute stud, yeah. and you see the chemistry there. That's a big Cornell chemistry. Yeah. Um, so that a lot of other teams I feel like are still growing, like that Wolfpack RTC, like we just talked about. Yeah. Um, I think Jagowski. Maybe like the only, you know, again, the only top tier guy on that team. But yeah. the rest of the team's coming together. Yeah, you said Nate Jackson's on there too, right? Nate Jackson's on the NJRTC. Yeah, the, NJR, the NJRTC. That's the one I wanted to. They're the up and coming ones that yeah. I believe, you know, with Reese Humphrey coaching, he's an animal. But I, I think he's one of those guys that might be a better coach than he was a wrestler, even though he was a phenomenal wrestler. Yeah. I think, again, Nate Jackson is a big guy who's made, like, a resurgence of his career, you know? Because in college, I think the only really thing I knew him for, you know, it was before my time, obviously, but the only thing I really knew him for because he was a guy who beat Bo Nickel. Yeah, no, he's he's got a hell of a blast double. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised, you know? Obviously, you're going to have uh, – I think everybody in the United States right now has David Taylor as a top dog at 86, right? But then you have uh, Zahid Valencia, Bo Nickel, Miles Martin, Nate Jackson, Alex Derringer. I think those are the guys right now. And if Hayden Zomer decides to cut down, which probably not going to happen. We have all these guys out here. But then they all get overlooked just because the one dude's at the top. Uh, I, I think David Taylor's got that spot. I truly do. Like, yeah. And I, I know not to overlook those guys because all of them are absolute hammers. Absolute hammers. I'll, I'll tell you, Alex uh, Derringer – He's a very cool guy, and I've never seen somebody more committed to the sport. Um, he's, he was the – when I was at Oklahoma State and I was wrestling there and helping out a little bit, um, he was the only guy that I met that would, like, write down his schedule every five minutes of the day into kind of what he wants to do, what he's going to do every five minutes, and he would have it on paper, um, which was so interesting to me how you can plan out every five minutes of your day. Um, and, it kind of, and he explained that this makes me – you know, me, makes me a better wrestler, makes me more disciplined on and off the mat. So, yes, I think David Taylor is going to win that, but I think the wrestlers behind him, once David Taylor might retire, yeah. is going to be a very interesting thing to see. Yeah, because I think the fact that people don't really understand is that David Taylor isn't young. Like, a lot of people only look at Jordan Burroughs as the older guy. Like, Kyle Dake, David Taylor, Alex Derringer are going to be out in, like, next few years, most likely. Definitely. What, what let's 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 move to like the Burroughs Day Quake class. Ben, what what kind of you got on that? Um. Well, one, you said Burroughs Day Quake class. Uh, they're not the same weight class. I know Burroughs well, is. They're not. They're not. But they're they're forced to be. They're going to be forced to be. Yeah. Um. It's. There's so much going into it. Again, everybody loves to call Jordan Burroughs the old man. But. What what's Day two years younger than him? Oh, uh, I think four. Four? Yeah, I think it's 32 and 28. Oh, I okay. don't know. I'm not sure on that one, but yeah. I, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Even at the end of the day, 28 years of wrestling, 32 years of wrestling, uh, they're, they're, they're old. Their bodies are, are old. Yeah. They've, they've, they've battled through a lot in their lives. And I think that um, there's, there's a lot going into it. I, I got to give it to the champ. I got to give it to, to Burroughs right now. I think Burroughs yeah, coming off that win with Valencia, you know, he's, he's obviously, he's got the gas in the tank. Obviously he's, st you know, he never lost the technique, but I think, um, yeah. I think he's uh, at the end of the day, I think he's still got the dog. I think he's still got the dog in him. Yeah. And I think so that's one, what will pull him out on top. Yeah. One quick thing I really want to touch on is 
you know, uh, a lot of people are not going to agree with me on this, but I think Isaiah Martinez cannot really be overlooked in this bracket. And if he wrestles no. to his potential against Kyle Dake, um, it's unlikely, but it's definitely possible in my opinion. Yeah, uh, and Isaiah Martinez for sure. And if we're talking at the world level, I, I mean, I don't know if you watched Dake versus Chimizo. I think Chimizo has his number next time it comes around. Yeah, I honestly wow. don't think Dake should have won that match. Was I so, surprised? And I shouldn't have been surprised. We all know Chimizo is a phenomenal wrestler yeah. uh, as he's had wins over, over Burroughs and, and many other top athletes. Yeah. But I was kind of surprised. I was expecting Dake to kind of put it on him and especially we bring it back to that trash talk bring it round circle here to the trash talk Dake said hey I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on you and and he absolutely did not and you're right I think it goes the other way next time yeah. I think the biggest factor with that is I think Chimizo naturally wrestles at 70 kgs and or 74 and Dake's weight is 79 you know if he goes down to 74 74 is where Chimizo feels more comfortable I think Chimizo is definitely the man but you have to realize that both these guys, like through what I've seen, I've started to look more into international wrestling. A lot of these, both these guys' strengths are their defenses. And then Chimizo's obviously has his athletic, the athleticism advantage on him. So if he can get on the attack, it's all depending on if he can finish or not. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting matchup. I really like um, Chimizo's wrestling style. Um, it's definitely a little unorthodox. Um, you know. I'm more of an unorthodox kind of wrestler myself. I, I really don't like fundamentals, even though they're crucial before you move on into those, you know, funky type skills. But we see that with Yanni. Um, Yanni, you know, beat some absolute studs. Like he beat Jordan Oliver um, in Vegas at the, I believe it was the world team trials. He teched him. Yeah, he, te he teched him. And he did some absolutely bizarre stuff we've never seen before. I, me personally, I was sitting front row for that. And that was an absolutely great tournament to watch. Um, from Yanni, and I would like to see more from him um, in that aspect. But I think that funkier wrestling style, that Chimizo, that Yanni, that um, um, Berjao, that all that stuff is great. Like, it's great for the sport. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people really get mad at me after I made my uh, 65 picks, you know. I think the most popular one's obviously going to be Yanni. He has all the hype right now just because everything he's done. My pick was, I think, uh, James Green to make the team. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Because I think if the weight cut doesn't affect him too much, I think he takes out Zane. Yeah, former former teammate of mine, actually, uh, Ryan Deacon. Uh, we went to yeah. Fargo together. Um, he upset James Green, which is actually Open, yeah. very – Yeah, it was very interesting to me and because he – all through high school. Like, he was a really good wrestler. Yeah. Um, but he never stood out to me as, like, an, an absolute just hammer. Yeah. And now he enters the college scene, and he's, like, built for it. So, it's, it's wild. It's yeah. absolutely wild. How this dude keeps making 57 is beyond me. No, oh, he's gigantic. He's yeah. absolutely huge. But that's why I think, you know, college wrestlers going into the college scene, not being the best right away, really helps them in the future. Um, of college and then international wrestling. Um, we see a lot of wrestlers go into it like that are the best and they do stay the best. But then we see a lot of wrestlers that do decline because they're not used to not being the best in the sport anymore. Yeah. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's like really interesting to me as you think about it, like Jordan Burroughs is going to be gone after this year. You know, I think, you know, as much as Kyle Day can want to say he's getting younger and all that crap. Right. He's got maybe the 2024 Olympics in France, and that's, that's going to be the end of him for Olympic runs. And that guy's a four-time national champ, you know, the first ever to do it at four different weight classes. And if even he can't make an Olympic weight class, that just shows how really irrelevant college is to international and senior level in general. Definitely. Well, it's, you know, completely different styles. It's different sports, as I said. You're competing in completely different sports. Um, and to kind of figure out that whole knowledge of both, it, that's, you know, you have to be a complete master of the sport. And that's why, that's why I love complimenting Kerry Colott to the accomplishments he made, not only in folk style, not only in high school, not only in college. He went to the international scene and, you know, he threw it down as well. And he was probably a better freestyle wrestler than he was in folk style, which is, you know, some people might not agree with, but, you know, he shows up every single time. Yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, What's your opinion on, like, 
a couple of these, like you see NAIA, JUCO, D3, D2 guys kind of making an appearance on the senior level now. I think the biggest talk about one was uh, Nazar Kolchiski making a, a bit of a run at one of these tournaments. You know, you have um, Hayden Zilmer, a D2 wrestler. Robbie Smith made an Olympic team. Uh, I think there's probably a couple more. There was another guy, I think, at 79 who almost beat Mark Hall, three-time Division II national champ. And then you see, like, a lot of these guys coming out here. Like, I think another one is um, Brandon Reed out of uh, the NAIA, two-time champ. What do you feel about these guys? I, I think that they're, you know, overlooked quite a bit. And as I explained, wrestling is a game of inches. It's a game of centimeters. It's very small margins. Um, do you know Isaiah White? He wrestled for Nebraska. Yep. He wrestled as a D2 he, guy. He, he was a D2 guy, exactly. So he was a D2 guy. I remember he was on a dual team of mine, and we wrestled, and I said, he's not D2. He was teching four times state champs, and I was like, this is guy is not a D2 guy. So I said, that is that the level that we're seeing in D2, or is he just in the wrong place? And, you know, he could be one of those cases where he should have been D1 from the start. Um, I think academics had a lot to do with it, but – yeah, he, you know, he showed up and he was from the D2 scene. So I think that we'll see some of those guys come up into the senior level and absolutely make a, a statement. Yeah, you know, uh, I know the kid that – like, I'm a true freshman, the kid that wrestles in front of me. Like, I wasn't actually recruited. I kind of just – you know, after I started this page, I started getting a bunch of connections. Coming out of high school, by no means was I a college-level wrestler. I kind of just got an opportunity because I was just texting a bunch of coaches. And this one, when he gave me a shot, right? I think it's probably the greatest thing I ever got. So make the best of it. But the kid that starts above me was a Pennsylvania state champ, ranked eighth in the country coming out of high school. And like me going into D2, I'm assuming like, oh, this is going to be a breeze compared to D1. And then I stepped on the mat with this guy just once. And it was probably the most eye-opening experience I ever had. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's definitely there's still a really high level of wrestling in D2. Yeah, um, yeah so – We'll let Ben kind of touch on that a little bit with uh, the difference between D1, D2, D3, and kind of the wrestling styles of each. And why do they separate each other, Ben? Um, obviously, as you guys know, D3, there's no scholarship. It's money, one. But two, the distinction between the, the Division One levels, Division Two, Division Three, is going to be the level of the coaches. And Kerry Colat talks about this a lot. He's not a coach in the traditional sense. He's a sled dog master, right? We're pulling the sled. He's just tweaking left and right, right? So by the time you make it into this Division One room, you've got the tools. You've got what you need. You've come through high school. You've proven what you need to prove. And Division Two, Division Three wrestlers have done that as well. They are, you know, wrestling is the factually the lowest continuation from high school to college sport in the in the nation. It's, it's like, it's like a 1.9% of high school wrestlers wrestling college. And they are, there proving that point. So I think really the, the difference between that D2 and that D3 level is going to be one, the coaches, because I was talking to Merch Marine coach, right? Yeah. He was, he was, he was a D3 wrestler and that was when his career ended. Right. Whereas now we've got Kerry Colat. NCAA Division One wrestler, world team member, world team finalist, right? Mm -hmm. We, that's that's I think a huge distinction for these for these. And then again, you've got the room, right? Once you once you've got once you've got, okay, this guy's a Pennsylvania state champ. This guy's a Minnesota state champ. You know, this guy's Colorado state champ. And then you come in and you get them scrapping with each other. They're taking things from each other. That's one of the biggest things that I've learned here. Is like. Man, you know, in in Colorado, we don't we don't do this at all. You know, I I never had to worry about this in Colorado, and now they're they're beating me up with it, and then I'll come in and I'll and I'll do something, and they're like, yo, like what is this? So I think I think really what it is is taking taking the the best of the best from each area, and then them learning from each other. I think that is is the biggest difference between D one and D two and D three because. D2, D3, once you're there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, I don't want to say there's, there's more opportunity, but there's, there's more local opportunity, right? I know, I know a lot of my friends, they went to um, Northwestern or Western state, sorry, Northwestern, Western state, which is a, 
a D2 school in Colorado and they've got their whole team is filled with a bunch of Colorado wrestlers, right? They've kind of built this wall against, against D2 level Colorado wrestlers and UNC is, is doing it now for D1. They're, they're building this wall against around high school Colorado wrestlers. And I think that that is the distinction is the, is the geography of the recruiting. Once, well, once someone's decided they're going to go D2, D3, they're like, well, I may as well stay home. I, I, can, I can go home. You know, I can take care of stuff at home and I can compete at the same level and for all intents and purposes, do the same thing. So a uh, quick thing I want to touch on, you know, you said the whole 1.9% of people will continue to wrestle in college that wrestlers in high school. So, you know, obviously I think most people are going to look at this in a sense that like it's harder to continue the sport just because you have to be better than most sports and there aren't enough opportunities. But would you also attribute that? Cause I think I've realized a lot, like California is a big wrestling state that's on the upcoming and they could have a lot of kids there. There are a lot of kids there that are obviously going to have college talent, but some schools just aren't, aren't allowed just due to their money and rules and regulations. They aren't allowed to recruit from out West. And I, I've also noticed a lot, like, I'm a big follower of, like, all New Jersey wrestling because I'm from Jersey. So I just followed a couple of the kids this year. Like, everybody's committing pretty early due to COVID. And uh, some of the best kids in the state, that I'm assuming we're just going to commit to, like, Big Ten schools or something. They're committing to places for, like, football and soccer, some of them, too. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of their decision. Um, but, yeah, wrestling, it's very hard to kind of get into – a team. And even if you do, it's not really guaranteed the first year. I know UNC's rule the first year is really nobody has a scholarship, um, except for like, unless you're a superstar name, um, Andrew Liras, of course, is going to get a pretty decent scholarship at UNC. Um, but the rule was, is nobody's really getting anything until your second year, until you prove yourself that, hey, you, you should really be here and you should be in a college room. Um, so they'll give you a few thousand here and there. But that's about it. And here's the thing. There's only 30 spots on a division one roster. So they can't go over that 30. So everybody that they already have there is included in that 30. So their recruiting, their recruiting class depends on how many spots they'll have open and how many people they might let go. If that makes sense. Um, my, my year, there was seven people actually cut from the team um, to allow more people to come in to UNC. Um, so it's very, it's, it's interesting that there's not, so many spots where, as you would said, in football and soccer, you see rosters of 52, 60 people. Yeah, they have over and, 100 sometimes at these. Divisions. Yeah, over 100. And so you have this number of 30, and there's, I think, what, 256 um, colleges that are allowing people to wrestle in. And so that times 30 doesn't compare nearly to football or soccer, uh, if that means. So it's a much harder, you know, group to kind of infiltrate. Uh, I think a couple of my friends that I was talking to, some guys that committed to big schools for football. I don't talk – I think a couple of kids committed to soccer that I was talking to and a couple of baseball here and there. But I think the biggest thing they were telling me, a few of them, they obviously said they just uh, prefer the other sport. Like, yeah, I respect that. Like, that's what they want to do, and that's what they're more passionate about. Can't really change that at that level. But a couple of them did say, because their high school already did cancel wrestling for this year, they didn't have good enough of a – junior season to really get recruited to the level they wanted to. But since their football season was already over, they were able to pull a division one offer out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's unfortunate. And I, I dislocated my elbow my senior year. Um, so I didn't even get to wrestle most of it. Um, but I, luckily I signed with UNC my junior year. So I, I like when things are done ahead of time and my, you know, kind of what my advice to give to other wrestlers out there and wanting scholarships and stuff like that is don't wait until your junior or senior year to reach out. Don't, don't wait. Um, I'm, I'm a big person in creating that, you know, bond with a coach. Um, give them a call your freshman year and say, Hey coach, I'm wrestling here. Are you going to be here? Or what tournaments are you at? What tournaments should I be at? Kind of get on their radar um, right away. And cause that really narrows the margin. Is a coach going to recruit a wrestler that he doesn't know at all or somebody that he's been familiar with since their freshman year? Yeah. I think that's kind of the one thing. Like, I'm putting a different circumstance. Like, I started running this page my junior year. 
And over the year, like, I think most of them are obviously going to be high school wrestlers. I have a good amount of connections with a couple of Division One guys. And then I get, like, the coaches here or there and, like, the wrestling dads, obviously. I think the coaches is, like, the one big thing that kind of helped me out. Because, like, even if I wasn't that good of a wrestler, like, I still had the presence with them. Like, they would know who I am just by, like – because I try to create, like, a persona for myself on this page. Like, just, like, show my face here and there. That's why I'm doing YouTube and all that stuff. I think that's what really helped me get into college ranks. And as we were speaking of this, I just got the Zoom message again. It says eight minutes and 50 seconds right now. So, Sweet. Well, we'll wrap it up then a little bit here. Um, ben, do you have any input on uh, kind of, you know, what, what kind of got you into college? Um, yeah, I was not recruited to wrestle at Navy. Um, and I think, honestly, had I um, had – the old coach remains, you know, we only found out that Kerry Cole, was going to be the coach of Navy March yeah. had, had the old coach remained. I still would have gone to Merch Marine, but um, I think that really, really just, just stick into, just stick into it, stick into what, you know, um, stick in, I completely lost my train of thought. Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah uh, actually, after this is done, if you guys have a picture together or something. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll throw that over to you. All right, sure. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's cool. You got it all on, on all the platforms and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I hope you keep growing as a, as a podcast and, and, you know, keep growing that media stuff. Another great thing I see a lot of coaches and, and media influencers do with wrestling is post technique videos and stuff like that. I know you've been doing that sort of thing and introducing people to the international wrestling scene. I think that. Yeah. Can you hear him? Um, uh, I can't. You can't. No, Brandon, you, you cut out there, but I can, but I'll, but I'll pick up on that. All right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's huge what you're doing. I'm looking at your page right now. Um, definitely, definitely taking that, that opportunity to, Am I back? to back. and and what you said okay. oh brandon's back now but what what you said about like posting 30 times a day that's huge you're getting yourself out there um definitely taking advantage of the social media because it's something that's you know for all intents and purposes yeah, it's new it's and it's yeah exactly yeah. so so being able to get in on as close to the ground floor of that as you can is huge for your brand and for you and uh definitely keep with it because you know, what you said you started your junior year, it's your freshman year of college. It's been what a year and a half, two years, and you're at what no. almost 14k. Yeah, yeah, huge. Killer. Also, I had uh, one question I think for both of you. Are you are you here right now? Or all right, you're good. I'm I can't tell if you're still frozen, you're just in still, but uh, yeah, I think if there's one thing you could look forward to next season, assuming we do have a season, what would it be? I'm making a state championship team, that's what I'm doing. Um, what about you, Ben? Um, trying to get some NCAA Division One matches. Show them what Colorado wrestling's about. Oh yeah, good podcast, guys. Thank you. All right, uh, yeah, so thank you guys for hopping on today. It's been a great episode. And uh, for all you guys watching, if you want to be notified about every single episode, click the link in the description. It'll send you to a link tree. Click the top one. Just enter your email, and then you're done right there, and you'll get emails after every one of my podcasts are published and uh so this has been episode 38 of late night shots and thank you guys for watching and we'll catch you again tomorrow